Uh, good morning. My name is Don Holden. I'm the Dean of Santa Clara University School of Law, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you here today for a roundtable conversation on the state of the net, the internet. And uh, we're so pleased and proud to have one of our graduates, one of our own here, um, eminently qualified, very knowledgeable on a variety of subjects related to, uh, to the internet. Um, and uh, uh, so it's a pleasure for me to welcome you and also to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker. Uh, I know for many of you that follow technology and the development of technology er areas and are voters in this area, our uh, speaker doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to uh, give her a very brief introduction and then uh, ask her to come up and speak with you all on, um, uh, on some of the issues that she is confronting uh, and working with uh, her colleagues in Washington that affect uh, technology and certainly uh, this vibrant part of uh, our nation. Um, uh, Congresswoman, uh, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren has represented the 16th Congressional District since 1994. By my math, that's 18 years, is that right? Seems like just yesterday, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned, she's a, a graduate of our uh, law school, practiced law in this area, knows this area very well, was born and raised in, uh, uh, in the Palo Alto, San Jose uh, area, and has represented it, as I mentioned, for 18 years. Uh, throughout that time of service, she's been on a number of uh, very important congressional committees in the House of Representatives, including the uh, sh her uh, service as chairing the House Ethics Committee. There's probably no more thankless job in Washington than chairing that committee, but she did it with uh, uh, considerable uh, skill, uh, diplomacy, uh, and integrity, uh, critical skills to have in that position. She's also served throughout the time in the House Judiciary Committee, uh, and I think some of that stemmed from work that she did uh, uh, as a staffer for many years uh, for her predecessor, and I think her very, very good, dear friend, uh, a great American, a great Californian, Don Edwards, um, who represented that district for uh, probably an equally long period of time. Um, so that was during the exciting days of Watergate and, and uh, United States Supreme Court inquiries into <laughs> separation of powers. And, uh, so certainly there is subject matter ex expertise that she had developed through that service. Um, and maybe more pertinent to this, uh, Zoe has been on the House uh, Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And it's from that, from that podium, if you will, from that platform that she's been able really to do so much in helping shape a lot of the technology uh, initiatives that uh, are being uh, discussed, have been discussed, and in some instances even passed in the uh, House of Representatives. So would you join me in welcoming uh, the Honorable Zoe Lawson? Well, thanks very much. It's um, when I'm back in these classrooms, it uh, brings back, even though it was a long time ago, I used to sit in the back and hide. Um, and I'm so honored that none of you are doing that. Um, I uh, am advertised today as speaking about a lot of things, post-SOPA, CISPA, high-skilled immigration, patent law, and uh, I might do all of that in questions, but I want to talk first a little bit about copyright, uh, SOPA, PIPA, and where we are, because I think this year, we'll see, uh, but I think this year might have been a, a divergent point in a very long battle about copyright and technology. Um, for over a decade now, what I would call extreme copyright laws and enforcement have uh, pretty much um, had their way uh, in Washington, and I think they've posed a threat to uh, innovation and certainly the openness of the internet. But in, in, in the past year, I think the SOPA PIPA uh, legislation took it to a whole new level of, of threat, where the um, would have really, if, if, you, if you backed out the uh, meaningless um, uh, prefatory comments, would have required a, uh, a system that required monitoring 
of the users of search engines and the internet. It would have used the same uh, technology, I'm not saying it would be for the same motive, it would be for enforcement of a legal right, but it would have required the use of the same technology uh, in use in repressive regimes like uh, China. And it would have uh, forced innocent uh, websites, cloud uh, computing uh, services, really, to keep track of everything that their users would do. And of course, because of these mandates uh, and a private cause of action, it would have triggered just a flood of uh, litigation. You know, it's always interesting to me that the Republicans on the committee, you know, bemoan the trial lawyers and frivolous lawsuits, they want to eliminate all litigation unless they're creating the possibility of trolls and frivolous lawsuits when it comes to copyright law. Um, now, I have been fighting this battle of, uh, about sensible copyright laws for a very long time. When I um, started in the Congress, uh, I'm, uh, many of you who are from this area may recall, I was not actually expected to win my election. And uh, I, I did do very well. I, I won in my primary, and the general election candidate who had expected to run against Don Edwards, who retired after 32 years, um, was not really a, a formidable opponent. And so um, election night, uh, I realized that I was going to have uh, a new experience for a Democrat, which was to be in the minority uh, in the House of Representatives after uh, many, many decades. And uh, so I found myself probably the least important person in the House of Representatives, a freshman member of the minority party, um, <laughs> assigned, and, and the, the members of the, Judi of the uh, uh, Democratic Caucus were in mourning, and they didn't even ask me what committee I wanted to be on. They just said, you'll be on the Judiciary and Science Committees. And so there I was. And honestly, without, I'd done immigration law, and I had uh, done a lot of environmental work and work on women's issues and justice, but I did not have a background in intellectual property. And what I found, thank goodness, is that the law professors uh, make their notes available online. And so I did uh, uh, the best I could to prepare myself uh, for the task. And right away, we did so something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and the first draft of that actually outlawed web browsing. And, and I thought, wow, what an extraordinary uh, thing. And I'll tell this story, some of you might have heard it before, but I was so concerned about the draft and how oblivious it was to technology and the actual absence of, of anybody from the technology sector speaking about it that I actually called the general counsel of Yahoo with someone I knew who'd gone to a school in Palo Alto and said, you ought to pay attention to this because it outlaws web browsing, which have an impact on Yahoo. And uh, it was kind of the reverse because the lobbyists are supposed to be calling the legislators, but um, I had to call them twice before they paid attention. And so that has kind of been the history of copyright and technology innovation. I mean, the, the media companies, what my friend Ron Wyden calls big content, uh, have been working for many years to do something that is legitimate. They want to make sure that what they've created is protected. That's not an evil or wrong thing. But how they have done it is often um, misadvised. Uh, for example, they thought the VCR would be the end of, of all media. They saw that DVDs would, would destroy Hollywood. So their take on technology has mostly been wrong, although their desire to, um, to protect their property is certainly a legitimate one, and one I think that we can talk about later we need to engage in as a, as a tech uh, community. So I, you know, I, I was able in the early days to get a few things in the DMCA. I helped work on the notice and takedown provisions, which it turns out has been very important, really even more important than we had anticipated in the middle of the 90s. The reverse engineering provisions, which are not nearly as useful as I thought they would be. Um, but basically this theory under the DMCA, that if you are an innocent conduit or you're a website, you don't have liability for what other people do, for other people's infringements. And that is, 
an extremely important principle because if you're the website, if you're the conduit, if you're the search engine, and you have liability for what others do, how you conduct your business is going to be completely changed. And the ability to have freedom on the internet, to avoid um, censorship, if you will, is it censorship if it's from a private party, is going to be completely different. And so uh, those battles have, have been incrementally lost, but Soper brought it to a new level. And I'll, I'll tell you, it was an interesting experience because I am used to being the only voice and losing uh, in, in these fights. And as, as time went on, um, I started to uh, speak out in the traditional ways. I gave radio interviews. I went, uh, Ed Black is here from CCIA. I think periodically I go to his group and complain about what is going on. Um, I, um, finally, I went to Mozilla Foundation in, in uh, May of last year. And I gave about an hour and a half lecture about PIPA and what was emerging in the house and said, this really is th the fatal blow, if, if you want. I mean, this is so far over the top that if you don't get involved, if you don't become engaged and have internet users become engaged, how the internet functions is going to be altered in a very important and I think adverse way. Um, on the other side was the Recording Industry Association, the movie industry, um, and uh, they have, and I don't want to berate them because they're business people and they do a smart thing, which is they promote their, what they think is in their interests and they develop over a period of time relationships with members of the legislature uh, so that they can accomplish their legislative goals. Now, they've been doing that for many decades, the tech sector has not, and the public never really engaged. Um, they, in, in terms of SOPA, PIPA, they wouldn't even talk to me or the tech sector about what was in the bill because they had the votes. They had the votes in the judiciary. Uh, Chairman Lamar Smith uh, was, uh, I'm not saying it wasn't bipartisan because my friend John Conyers was a co-sponsor, but certainly this was a Republican effort more than any other to go farther than, than we had ever gone before in the House. Bob Goodlatte, the chair of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee, Alar Lamar Smith, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, were full speed ahead with the help, honestly, of uh, the minority, many, some of the minority, who really didn't have a say, but were not objecting. Um, as, as the fall proceeded, I started to engage uh, with people in the tech sector in a different way, saying, you know, if you don't get users, the only way we're going to stop this, I remember saying, is if we melt the phone system down. Um, and, and thinking about things that were on their way, I thought, sadly, about the immigration reform bill in the Senate a number of years ago when George Bush was president. We hoped to get immigration reform Hey, how are you? Um, done at, at that time. And even though the vast majority of the American uh, voters, we know this through uh, polling, believe that we should reform the immigration laws in roughly the way that the Senate wanted to do, a, a, a people who were opposed to Im immigrants, really, melted the phone, actually melted the phone system. The Senate phone system could not function because of the number of phone calls coming in. And, uh, and derailed uh, the measure. Not only did they derail that bill, but they, um, they derailed discussion of the subject for years to come. And so I think there was, you know, I don't want to say I did the shutdown because certainly no one person did, but there was a lot of discussion in the tech sector and people think it was Google. I love Google, but it wasn't them. It was smaller kind of startup people. Uh, my staff was on one, uh, conference call in November and one of the CEOs of a small company said, you know, they used to push us around in the playground, but not this time. Uh, and I thought, okay, cool. Um, and so there was a plan, and some of you had watched and read it, where there was kind of a tentative discussion of should GoDaddy, who of all the tech companies came out in support of SOPA, should TechDaddy 
go unremarked about this. And so there was an effort to organize firing GoDaddy as, as a provider. And the first reaction of GoDaddy was no big deal, we don't care. And it took only about 48 hours for them to get their attention caught and to remove their support from a soap, which they should never have supported it to begin with. Um, that was a sort of a test run. And there was a plan to actually uh, do uh, a shutdown, except that how do you do it? I mean, the net has never done anything like this. And the, and the nature of the internet and internet companies is that they, they don't collaborate. That's what we love about it. And so as we were moving forward, we went into the markup. And one of the things that I feel very good about is that um, speaker, <coughs> no longer speaker, Nancy Pelosi was willing to uh, appoint uh, Jared Paulus to the Judiciary Committee. There was a vacancy, and Jared uh, got the support of the entire Hispanic Caucus because he's wonderful on the issue of immigration reform. He is a gay man, uh, and since Barney Frank and Tammy Baldwin left, there's never been an LGBT member of the Judiciary Committee. He pointed that out. But he's also somebody who has roots in the tech sector. And so he was appointed to the committee, I think, was it two or three days before the markup of SOPA began. And we had, in my office, been meeting Anna Eshoo, Jared Paulus, and myself, bringing people in from the tech sector, not only uh, representatives from companies, but also from nonprofits, saying, what's the strategy here? Is anybody contacting members of the legislature? And trying to, to map out with the private sector a strategy. Obviously, uh, we were not in a position to stop the markup, but we did manage to come up with a series of, of solid amendments. Actually, I think it was something like 100 um, that were real amendments. I mean, they weren't just to delay. They actually made a point about the bill. Uh, the, the market was scheduled to begin midweek, but on Monday night, a 90, I think it was 92 page manager's amendment was released, and my poor staff had to stay up all night because they completely changed it. And so I did something that is ordinarily not well received. Uh, under the rules of the House, you to make things move, I mean, if you read everything, it would take forever. You ask unanimous consent to waive the reading of the bill, because otherwise, under the arcane rules of the House, you have to read the whole bill aloud, or, and to waive the reading of amendments, because otherwise it would take a long time. And uh, I refused to give consent to the wa uh, waiving of the reading of the amendment because it was over 90 pages and no one even knew what was in it. So for an, over an hour, the young clerk, she did a great job, read aloud the amendment. And uh, so the people could know what was in it. And I thought, although people were grumpy about it, that was an important beginning of the committee. And so we started with the various amendments. We had uh, talked to members of the Republican Party and we had some support, Daryl Issa, who I disagree with on so many things, but we agreed on this. And my philosophy is, you know, if you disagree on 90 things, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't work on the 10 things that you agree on. And so we did work together on this. We did. Daryl put up a website uh, so that we could stream the hearing. Uh, uh, Jason Chafe is a young guy who, again, I don't agree with on a lot of things, but you know, we recruited him to be on our side on this. And so we at least had four people. Um, to talk about these amendments as time uh, went on. And we got a few others because by then, members of the public were starting to weigh in uh, with uh, their legislators. And so although we didn't win any amendments really, um, we did make a point on each one. And it went on and on. I mean, at 10 o'clock at night, we finally uh, recessed to go into session the next day. And of course, by then we were ready to go home and recess for the year. This was in December. And uh, I found out walking over uh, to the house that over 200,000 people had watched the markup of SOPA on the, on, the, on the Judiciary Committee. I think that broke records for people watching a markup. And it did this. I mean, as I look back, what happened was people started to realize 
haiku sites like Reddit, and there were lots of things tweeted, and and other, you know, not Google, but little mid-level sites uh, that something was going on. And a lot of people watched this, and they were pretty stunned, I think. Uh, the feedback I got from people who watched the hearing was that these people don't know what the internet is, and they're about to regulate it in a way that makes no sense at all. And uh, the delay was key because it gave an opportunity for people to act who are not used to collaborating and organizing to actually organize this blackout. Now, of course, not everybody blacked out. Uh, Google didn't black out, and I, I never asked them why, although I did urge them to participate. Um, you know, somebody told me if Google participated, the, the stock market would crash, and it might. I mean, you know, people are Googling information. They have contracts with advertisers. I mean, it's harder for some people to shut down than others, but they did put a little banner where you could uh, click through to law professors' articles and figure out, you know, for yourself, what was going on. We had Wikipedia was uh, a, a leader and, and Reddit played a tremendous role. And so I knew, actually, Craig Newmark, of course, did the blackout on Monday instead of Wednesday. Um, <laughs> and I knew that something was going on when my neighbors on the, the le list were saying, something's happening to the internet. Craig's list is down. And uh, the question, what we didn't know was how many people were going to respond. I knew something would happen. <coughs> and the day dawned, and the internet into the website started to, to slow. I couldn't click through to Ron Wyden's uh, website or to Jared's. Um, the phones were unbelievable. And I thought, you know, this is going to work. And by, by 10, co-sponsors of the bill were going to the floor asking to have their name removed from the bill as a co-sponsor. And it was, uh, it was really unprecedented in the House of Representatives. People who had been co-sponsors of the bill trying to get off because their constituents were upset. Now what does this mean for regulating the internet in the future? I think that we're not through with proposals to um, to put liability on search engines, on, on hosts of websites, to really undo the understanding of the DMCA. Because uh, big content believes that they are being injured by uh, infringement. And so I think it is very important for the tech world to sit in a way that's collaborative with the content world and say, how are we going to resolve this legitimate issue? There's some things you can't do, but there's some things you can do. And I think that we have a window of opportunity here where we can sit down in, in a collaborative way and come up with solutions instead of a fight. And I think that, that kind of collaboration almost has to happen outside of Washington. I think we're likelier to have that happen in Silicon Valley than we are in DC because when you hire a lobbyist, their job isn't to find a resolution, their job's to win for the side they've been hired on. Uh, and so uh, I hope that we can have that kind of dialogue. Um, I do think uh, that how we do that is going to have to be different. You know, most legislation is not done on the internet. Most rough drafts are not posted online. That's not the legislative process, and for a lot of reasons, that actually works. Uh, but I think there's an expectation among the public that there will be a high level of transparency on this particular issue, and I actually think that is a very good thing. The time when I could go with a colleague in a back room and write it up, I think that's gone, um, and that's to the good. Uh, but we will have to, as legislators, we're going to have to work together and legislate, but I think we're going to have to be inclusive and transparent, and not just with the tech companies. They have an important role, but their interests are not identical with the public interest. We need to make sure that the nonprofit world and the public itself has an opportunity to take a look at what the various schemes and theories and proposals are so that we know that in, uh, in defending the legitimate rights of uh, copyright holders were not infringing on the legitimate rights of free speech and privacy of users. 
Now, there are some other uh, problems that we have. I was mentioning to someone coming in that there's been an infrastructure built up uh, on overzealous enforcement. Um, and th that is going to have to be undone over a period of time. Recently, the uh, Register of Copyrights, Maria Palenti, said this, copyright is for the author's first and the nation's second. And when she appeared before our uh, House Administration Subcommittee, since our committee oversees the uh, office, the copyright office, I asked her about how that could possibly, was that true? Did she actually say that? And how could that be since the Constitution uh, really says that we are giving authors a limited uh, authority but for the purpose of promoting the uh, useful arts? And she quoted two cases that actually had nothing to do, I guess she assumes that members of Congress don't read law, uh, Supreme Court <laughs> cases, that were, had nothing to do with what she was saying. But she is there um, really having, she talked about the meetings she'd had. I insisted that she send a list of the meetings that she has had secretly. And she meets constantly with the movie association, with the recording association, with the publishers association. On, I mean, on a constant basis, she'll take a phone call from time to time from the EFF. Um, but, I mean, she, she sees apparently her role as to be the advocate for big content. And I don't think that is the role for a neutral person who's in a regulatory agency in the federal government. That's not the job. Otherwise, you'd be paid for. Uh, your salary would be paid for by the um, big content. We've got in the trade arena the, um, a similar kind of secret effort underway where the trade representative has, has worked very collaboratively with the content industry, with, uh, especially with Hollywood, to try and get into trade agreements what you could never get past now in the House of Representatives and to bind the United States through those trade agreements. We have something called uh, ACTA which um, actually through some, through some efforts made here did back down a little bit from the overreach but was still problematic in some regards that because of, I think of our advocacy on SOBA has now been defeated in most of the uh, legislatures in, in Europe. Uh, there's another effort underway by the trade representative to do a deal in, uh, in Asia uh, and again, these are all secret meetings. I'll just give you one example before I move on to some other topics. Uh, the trade representative had a meeting in Southern California, and it was all with the heads of the movie uh, studios to talk about what to put in this deal, I assume. Uh, I don't know because I wasn't invited to the meeting. Uh, one of the advocacy, the internet advocacy uh, groups found out about this meeting and decided to rent a room right next door to the uh, secret <laughs> meeting. And when they, when they found out, they, they made the hotel yank the rental agreement um, because they don't want any transparency. I think that's a problem. If we have transparency in the legislative process and in the administration, we're going to end up with a much better product. And if it is something that doesn't violate the free speech and privacy rights of internet users, then <coughs> having it be transparent is not going to be a problem. Uh, uh, people will be reassured by what they see. If it is a problem, then uh, we can correct it in a, in a process that's not a secret one. Um, other issues on, on the internet. There was a little bit of an uproar, and I think uh, properly so, on, on the cybersecurity bill that was recently passed. Uh, in the House of Representatives. There is a problem with cybersecurity, and some of it I can talk about, some of it I can't because it's classified, but we, there is a legitimate issue and we need to do a lot more as a nation than we have done to defend ourselves against a cyber attack. Having said that, I don't think that CISPA, which the House passed, is going to do anything other than potentially violate the privacy rights of users of, of the internet. Uh, there needs to be information sharing, but it's really from the government to, to the private sector uh, in terms of uh, alerting, I mean, 
what the government knows, which is actually quite a bit if you include NSA, about the attacks that are coming to us so that the private sector can take, and, and in the Senate version, will, will need to take steps to protect themselves. Uh, what we don't need is, the, is complete liability relief for any private sector a recipient of data to be able with impunity, this repeals every Privacy Act provision in federal law to give any information asked for to the federal government. I mean, how does that make us safer? It doesn't. Luckily, President Obama has threatened to veto the bill should it reach him. And, uh, but the sad thing is that we, are, uh, we have not yet come to grips with what we are going to do on cybersecurity. And it is a threat that I think is real and actually maybe even a growing threat with the increased discussion of the weaponization of uh, cyber attacks that have occurred in the last uh, few weeks. On patents, I just, I just want to talk a little bit about the patent bill which ended up being, you know, I started working on the patent reform bill in the, in the 90s and I remember I was managing the bill uh, one evening in 19, 98, I believe, uh, and my colleague Dana Rohrabacher ran to the floor and he said, the Red Chinese are coming to steal our secrets because of the patent bill. I'm going, what is this guy talking about? It, you know, it has been kind of a crazy discussion for many years and in the, in the midst of that craziness, we tried on a bipartisan basis to get something that would resolve the issue of patent trolls, that would promote um, innovation, and I would say that for the most part we failed. Um, the bill that we passed last year celebrated on a bipartisan basis because everybody wants something to celebrate if they're in, in Congress, basically didn't do very much except potentially uh, have an adverse impact on innovation because of its uh, inability to deal with prior use and to protect small inventors in the first year after, um, under the first to file uh, provision. We recently had a hearing uh, to celebrate our great accomplishment in the uh, Judiciary Committee and one of the questions I asked the witnesses was, you know, how much sense does it make um, if you have, and recently there was an analysis showing that on your average social network uh, site there's 30,000 patents. If there are 30,000 patents on one social network site, there might as well be none because uh, there's no way an engineer is going to be able to figure out how to get through that little packet uh, 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 forest and there's going to be litigation and you can see it now and I'm not criticizing anybody's, I'm a lawyer, I'm, you know, <coughs> litigation is our life's blood. Um, <laughs> Giants suing each other, little guys suing giants in the reverse. It's all for a business reason, so I'm not going to crit it. But how is that good for innovation? That's just time and money spent and diverted from inventing things. And so I'm hopeful that we can have a discussion again here in the Valley to see is there a way out of this uh, thicket that we're in because I, I don't think it is promoting entrepreneurship or innovation. Uh, finally, just a few words about um, immigration and what was the other topic I'm so sorry uh, oh patent law immigration um, no I have, I serve as the senior Democrat on the immigration subcommittee in the House Judiciary Committee and uh, prior to serving as the uh, so-called ranking member that's what it's a weird name isn't it uh, if you're the senior uh, member on the minority side I chaired the subcommittee for four years but uh, looking back, it's worth remembering that since the Republicans took the House of Representatives in Jan on January 4th of 1995, there have only been two years when there was a majority of Democrats in the House, Senate, with the Democratic president. And in that brief two-year period, we did a lot. I mean, we did financial reform, we did health care, we did Lily Ledbetter uh, Pay Equity Act, we cut uh, interest rates and student loans in half, we increased the amount of Pell Grants and eligibility, increased the deductibility of, of uh, college tuition and many other things, but one of the things we did not accomplish was immigration reform because as you'll recall, in the fall of 2008, the economy was basically collapsing 
and uh, we were diverted, and I think properly so, by trying to get uh, that big recession from turning into an actual depression. We might have succeeded at that, and we're still suffering from the fallout of that, and Europe is now uh, having a slow motion train wreck. Um, but we, we failed to do the immigration reform, and it's something I regret uh, a great deal, because I have spent much of li my life working on immigration. As a matter of fact, I used to teach immigration here, uh, at, at not as the tenured faculty, but as an instructor uh, when I was um, here locally before I was elected to Congress. So what do we need to do? We tried to do a comprehensive uh, reform bill uh, in the Congress, and we failed. Um, we need comprehensive reform. We have, for example, something like two million farm workers who are in the United States, 70, 80 percent of them don't have their papers, want to know how many visas are available each year for uh, people who don't have a college degree who are immigrating based on their work? 5,000. 2 million, 5,000. We kind of set this up. Uh, and now we have people who we need to be here, and yet there's no way for them to get right with the law. We ought to come up with a scheme for people who are here doing things we need uh, or who are uh, connected very tightly with our community or who are married to Americans or who were brought here as little kids who didn't make a decision and they're de facto Americans. We need to have provisions in law that allow them to get right with the law and move on with their lives. Um, we also, however, need to make sure that we're not killing ourselves when it comes to high-tech immigration. Now, if you take a look at some of the stats, 25% um, of all the engineering and startups in the United States were started by immigrants. In this valley, more than half of the startups were started by immigrants. Uh, you know, I meet with people all the time. Recently, I met with a group of young uh, people. Um, almost all of them had graduated with their PhDs from Stanford in some scientific stuff I didn't, I couldn't even understand. Um, and they were all, you know, inventing things. And they were from different parts of the world. Uh, they were from uh, England, and they were from Germany, and they were from India, and, and other places. And it, it's kind of like s salmon trying to spawn. Everybody's coming to Silicon Valley. This is the place to be, to start your company. And you could not get from where they were to where they need to be to start their companies here. And they're trying every which way. I'm trying to help them. So how is that good for the United States? These brilliant young people are going to start a company, and they're going to create a gazillion jobs, and we're going to make them do it in another country. I just don't see how that is good for my constituents or my country. And so I introduced a bill um, that basically fixes all the problems on immigration when it comes to um, technology. It's called the IDEA Act. You know, driving immigration driving entrepreneurship in America. The title actually was my staff came up with it because you need an acronym, right? Um, basically, it recognizes that if you go to the top universities in the country today, universities that are research uh, funded, funded by the federal government for research, and you look at who is getting uh, their top degrees in what's called STEM fields, engineering, mathematics, half of them are foreign students. Um, and those, those individuals are going to, in, in many cases, go out and start companies. I think Google, uh, Sergey Brin was born in Russia. I'm glad Google's in Mountain View instead of Moscow. You think of um, Andy Grove. I mean, he came, Sergey came because his mother was, and father were refugees. He didn't come on, a, on a, uh, a, a visa based on his skills, but he is an immigrant. Um, Andy Grove came as a refugee from Hungary and helped uh, make sure that, that Intel worked well. Just go around the valley and you can see the role it's played. Uh, talking about innovation, we need a startup visa for people who uh, want to start up uh, companies. And so the bill has a, a startup visa uh, component. 
It also notes that not every business is venture uh, funded. Um, I think of Marvell. Anybody heard of Marvell up on 237? Sure. Wonderful uh, uh, company. The, the two co-founders actually are amazingly smart people. Uh, she was born in Shanghai and he was born in Singapore and they met while they were getting their PhDs in engineering at Berkeley. Um, they didn't get venture funding. What they got was they had an idea to build a company and they, and they maxed out their credit cards and they got money from their, you know, their relatives and they didn't take any salary and they worked like crazy and now they employ 3,500 engineers. Uh, right there on 237 and they're very popular. So I mean I'm glad that they're here innovating and employing my constituents. We need to have the ability for people like them to, to get, of course they did it when you could get a visa, we need to have the ability for people like them to be able to stay here and start these, those uh, building uh, companies. And also there are, there are uh, small uh, businesses that are started by immigrants. Um, not every, uh, not every small business becomes uh, uh, Cisco. Some remain small and, and just employ 10 or 15 people. That matters to the 10 or 15 people. So I think if you look at immigration as an engine of growth for the country, how do we dissect it and make sure that this engine helps grow our economy and grow jobs instead of, I mean, every week, we have a hearing where the Republicans say immigrants are they're to blame for every problem in America, and it's a zero-sum game. If an immigrant takes a job, it's a job that American doesn't have. Instead of looking at you grow the economy by creating more jobs, and all the people who are creating companies and creating economic activity are helping to grow that economy and grow the jobs. It's a competing vision. And I think, obviously, since I think it, uh, that the grow your economy vision is the appropriate uh, one. And finally, it does a, a few other things, but I think it's important in this valley to talk about the reform of the H-1B uh, program. For many years, I've heard complaints about the H-1B program, and when you look into the program, there are problems, and it does need to be reformed. Some of them are abuse, uh, and the abuses ought to be gone after. And some of them are structural, where the participants aren't trying to do a bad thing, but because the program is designed in a particular way, they're stuck. One of the things I hear about is that, you know, you've got an American engineer working next to an engineer on an H-1B and doing equivalent work, or maybe even the H-1B is doing a little higher level work, but the H-1B person is being paid less. People resent the heck out of it, so they should. Turns out, when you apply for that H-1B visa, you're stuck in terms of the job description and the salary. And so the visa is for three years, it's renewable, and you can actually get extensions if you've applied for the permanent visa. So you've got an engineer who's on the H-1B basically frozen. The, the salaries, if they change everything, they've got to change the application for the permanent visa. And so it's just natural that as people grow <coughs> in, in their skill set, they're going to do more and you end up with a situation that is unacceptable. So rather than just complain about it, we ought to make it flexible. It ought to be possible while that visa petition is pending to have uh, you know, some, some salary flexibility for that person, some growth. The other thing we need to take a look at is why are we waiting so, what is the delay on this? Um, we recently looked at uh, visas that are allocated on a per country basis. That's the way we do I immigration and have since 1965. Well, it turns out that India, with a population of 1.2 billion people, has the same number of visas as Iceland with a population of 350,000. And so it's not such a surprise then that the delay for someone who has been approved for a visa because of their skill set and have to advertise and the like, uh, they've been approved, they will wait 70 years if, if they're born in India and no years if they're born in Iceland. Well, what is that, how does that make any sense? I mean, if the idea is it's based on your skill set, not on where you're born, you're, you're born, why should it be, 
why should it have anything to do with it? I had a bill when I was chair um, that eliminated the per country limits, but it did something else. Because we've got backlogs, it recaptured the visas that were in the law and intended to be awarded but never were for bureaucratic de delays. Jim Sensenbrenner, who you probably don't know, but he's a very conservative man, um, Republican from Wisconsin. He uh, had a bill that was, you know, wildly opposed by immigrant rights groups back in about 10 years ago, but he co-sponsored this recapture bill with me because it was what the Congress always intended to do. If you put the two together, it kind of fixed the whole problem. Right now, Congress is incapable of solving problems in that way. And so we had a bill that only eliminates the per country cap. What it does is it, it backlogs everybody for 12 years, but at least it's more realistic than a 70 year date for uh, China. I think it was in the 40s if you were born in, uh, in China, excuse me, or 70 for India. So we passed this, it was bipartisan. I think there were a handful of no votes on the floor of the House. And of course it went to the Senate where Senator Grassley put a hold on the bill and could not explain to anybody what was wrong with it and it has not moved, even that little thing uh, in, in the U.S. Senate. So um, where does that leave us in terms of uh, the future on immigration? Yeah, I don't want to sound too political, but um, we have gained consensus on the Democratic side on immigration reform. My friends in the Hispanic Caucus, and I admire them and consider them my dear friends, had, had, had believed that if you, unless you did everything, you would be unable to do um, the various pieces. They've actually come to a different conclusion that you could pair and move big pieces of the agenda. It's all valuable, I agree. And so Luis Gutierrez, who is the chair of the uh, Hispanic Caucus Immigration Task Force and a, one of the most vocal advocates for immigration reform from A to Z, is an original co-sponsor of this IDEA Act. Um, and which I think we have the entire broad spectrum of the Democratic Party on this IDEA Act. When I introduced the bill, or before I introduced the bill, I went to all of the usual suspects on the Republican side. Even though we don't agree on a lot of things, it's not true that we can't work together. I mean, as we did with SOPA, with Daryl and Jason, you go through and see how do we find consensus and move forward. I couldn't find a single person who was willing to step forward and um, co-sponsor the bill. Some of them were candid enough to say they were afraid of the Tea Party. Um, and so we finally introduced the bill with Democrats only, just so it could be a model for what we should do. Um, because Silicon Valley is the checkbook for all political campaigns, uh, we have um, members of both parties coming here, I mean constantly, having fundraisers and meeting with people, and the Republicans are here all the time. And when they come, my friends in the tech world tell me, they ask them, what are you doing about startups? What are you doing about uh, you know, the PhD recipients at Stanford this year that we're gonna make go back to Britain? Um, and they say, well, we're, we're on your side. But nothing has happened. Various bills have been introduced that probably are not going to pass. So I honestly think it's unlikely, although I'm willing to work with anybody, uh, if, if I prove, <coughs> if I'm incorrect, uh, that we will see any sensible reform on the immigration law this year. If President Obama is reelected, uh, and if the House of Representatives changes its major majority, as Nancy Pelosi says, our drive for 25 seats, I think we'll have a window of opportunity to actually do this. Um, and I'll stop with this, uh, uh, discussion and then I'd like to get some questions um, and I'll also take advice because I can always use it. When I was chairing the committee, uh, the immigration subcommittee, we decided um, that we should have discussions with really, really conservative Republicans to see is there a basis for moving forward. And we had secret meetings. 
I can talk about it now because one of the participants admitted that we had secret meetings on TV. Uh, but we have never said who participated. Uh, or, or the details of what we came up with. But I will say this, we had over 100 hours of meetings by the members of Congress themselves. And that probably doesn't mean anything to you. That is very unusual. It is very unusual that members will sit and work through legislation personally for any number of hours, especially hundreds of hours. And the reason why we did it was to see I didn't want to say, well, you know, position A, can't you agree with that? I wanted people to understand exactly what it would do, what the arguments against it would be, and, you know, what the numbers of people would be so that, it, you know, everybody knew what we were talking about. And then we had discussions, and it was a very interesting experience for me because I'm not a conservative. I mean, I grew up in this valley, half the people, uh, who live in, in this valley came from another country. Uh, there's no ethnic majority in the county and people are pretty happy with that. Um, that's not the view in every part of the United States. And so I had to listen and kind of try to understand where people were coming from, a place different than me, and it was a learning experience. But at the end of that time, we ended up with a bill, not exactly what I would write, but acceptable, uh, practical, it would have worked. Um, that we all agreed to and we watermarked the copies and then the Democrats lost control of the House and we'd all agreed that no matter who gained control of the House we would move with this bill but what we didn't factor in was that the Tea Party would play the role that it was playing and so it became politically impossible to move forward even though those very conservative people who I learned to respect uh, even though I didn't agree with them on so many things, they couldn't move. I understood that politically. And so the issue, I mean, lobbying is the art of how do I help you help me, right? Um, how do we create an environment where it is possible for sensible people of good faith to do sensible reform of a law that basically doesn't work? How do we create a political environment where that becomes possible? And I think that's a responsibility not just for members of the legislature, although it is our responsibility, but it's also a responsibility for the people of this country uh, to step forward. How do you use the tools to engage in a dialogue that makes it possible to move forward? And that brings us back to the beginning of our discussion, which is SOPA. <laughs> One of the things that's so interesting about SOPA is that the American people, some of the estimates are 14 million people connected with their members of Congress. That's remarkable, but the more remarkable thing that people thought was that they won. Not only did they speak, but they were heard. Mm -hmm. And that's a very yeah. important and empowering thing for the, for the voters and people of this country. And there was a, sort of a euphoria after that, that you know, that on everything we would have that. Well, you don't have that kind of outpouring on everything. I mean, and you know, the, some of the content people said, well, the tech company's gonna use that to get their tax bill through. And I said, you don't understand. This wasn't about Google. This wasn't, this was about the American people who spoke up. And they're not gonna weigh in on some tax fight. I mean, that's not that, it, their issue. Their issue was about freedom and free speech and privacy rights. And I think I'm hopeful that people of good faith might also use the internet as a way to connect and to speak out on an issue like this. Because if we can't get this right, we have a big problem in this country. My grandfather was an immigrant. He came here when he was 60. And I think sometimes about him when I'm on the House floor about how that guy who didn't have anything came here without any luggage and now his granddaughter's in the Congress. This country was built by people with enough get up and go to get up and go. And when we, when we cut off that capacity, the people with the, the grit and the guts to come here and create a new life, we're doing something very damaging to the character of the country. And so I'm hopeful that as time goes on and I'm talking to people you know, this is not the issue of the tech company overall, but it is the issue for America, and that the American people can come together and make progress on that by insisting to their uh, Congress that they do so. So with that, thank you for letting me speak to you this morning, and I'd love to have a few questions. Thanks very much. A lot of folks.
folks are saying that this is the most uh, polarized Congress in uh, many, many decades. Do you think it's just the Tea Party, or is there something else that prevents the Republicans from cooperating with the, uh, with the Democrats in Congress? Why, why are we at constant deadlocks, stalemates, and so forth? I think there are a number of, I mean, obviously, this is just my opinion. But I think there are a number of things going on. Um, first, there's President Obama. And I think Senator McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, was maybe too candid when he said the only thing we care about is keeping him from being reelected. Um, Couldn't Boehner say the same thing, telling his disciples not to pass any legislation? Well, they've, they've not been the overt, but when you take a look at the pattern of behavior, I think that is the mega goal that they have that drives almost everything that they do, which is how can they take action that will prevent the president from be being reelected. Um, now that means you can't do something that's productive for the country, in my judgment. I think there's a reason why Boehner mm -hmm. suggested that we would have a dust up over the uh, debt ceiling, which is not necessary in the summer. The debt ceiling probably carries us into next year, certainly till after the election. Because it'll drop, I mean, we dropped the one whole bond rating the last time we did that meaningless fight. And if they have that meaningless fight again in, in the summer, you know, maybe it'll impair the economy a little bit more. Maybe it, then that would not be good for the president's reelection. Um, the transportation bill in the Senate, I mean, Senator Inhofe, who is like so far to the right. He's the guy who's, he's the climate change denier. And Barbara Boxer, I mean, she is not a right winger. I mean, she is on the, the, the way democratic side in the Senate. Inhofe and Boxer were able to come together and do a transportation bill. It's like a miracle. You know, only three or four people voted against it. And we said, why don't we just take that one? That works. Well, no, because you know, there's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of jobs that will be created when that bill is passed. Nobody can let a contract now because they don't know what, what the funding is going to be. And so holding that up actually has a very negative impact on economic growth. I think the Republicans will pass it, you know, just before the election so they don't get the blame. But it's going to have a negative impact. And I think it's intentional. So, I mean, that's one element of it. Then there's the element of the Tea Party, and they're not all stupid. I mean, I don't mean to say that they're stupid, but they have a different viewpoint than I do. And you see um, Mr. Boehner will sometimes come up with an agreement. He can't deliver the, the deal because his, his freshmen, have, they're on a different, they're, they're marching to a different drummer. And so that makes for a very volatile uh, situation. And I'll just throw in, there's probably many other things. The divisions in the Congress, to some extent, reflect the divisions in the country. And, and there's, a, there's an echo chamber back and forth between the country and the Congress. When um, Joe Wilson shouted out, you lie, during the president's speech, I was stunned. I'd never seen anything like that. Um, you know, everybody, including the Republicans, thought, you know, that you don't do that. That's not the way the Congress works, and he should immediately apologize. And instead, he raised over a million dollars online for saying that. Um, you know, Alan West said there, there's 68 communists in the Congress. People, what, what is this, Joe McCarthy? You know, and, and people said, well, he should say something. You know, Alan who I find is kind of an offbeat character, Alan raised a huge amount of money online. Uh, one of my colleagues who was defeated and maybe coming back used to say really over the top things. And I mean, he didn't ask my permission to say those over the top things. And he would raise a lot of money after he said it. So I mean, some of this, you know, you get a reward by being off the wall, and uh, which I think is very negative. And then you've got um, the country ready to believe the worst uh, of the people they elected. And so that the, the extremists who, who paint these science scenes kind of feed that. And you end up with a very bad situation. I think it's a very bad situation. Yes, sir. 
Hi. Uh, when you talked about, uh, I don't remember your exact words, but rolling back the copyright enforcement machinery, and you mentioned the Copyright Office and the USTR. Not, I don't um, think I, that's exactly what I said, but I go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't mean to mischaracterize what you said. Uh, 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 my one question is, what, what do you have in mind with whatever your goal is in that something like that, or whatever you were talking about? And the other thing is, when it comes to the new discussions on uh, copyright legislation, uh, what is going on in that direction? Is there some? Is there any prospect of anything this Congress, or is it all for next Congress? And and what are the outlines of what a, uh, a reasonable deal would look like? Well, I think you know. It's overreach. I believe in copyright, and I think copyrights deserve uh, to be enforced. So, I mean, we don't have a fight about that. The question is, how do you warp technology innovation in the effort to um, uh, inf enforce your copyright? Do you violate every law? I mean, for example, the Attorney General was before the Judiciary Committee this last week. I, I thought his answer to my questions were disappointing because in December, when he appeared before us, I asked him about a case called uh, DeJazz. DeJazz was a, uh, a website, it was a uh, hip hop, I don't know, because I don't know hip hop, but it was, it blogged and it also released uh, music. And under operation in our sites, the uh, ICE seized the uh, site. Now, under the law, you have 90 days to go in and contest the seizure. And, and the standard is you have, have probable cause that the thing you seized was an instrument in the, um, in the illegal activity. So I, I talked to the lawyer who was retained by DeJazz. They tried to, to go in and contest the seizure because their position is that they didn't infringe at all. The, the labels were sending them the, 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 the uh, files to play as kind of a teaser. Right? They weren't infringing at all. That was permitted use. Plus, it was commentary in blogs. It had, uh, it had free speech, First Amendment protections. There was never a hearing. It was all under seal. And I read, now EFF, I believe, got the, uh, the entire file. The affidavits from ICE are, we cannot reveal our sources because it would put at risk our witnesses. This goes on for a period of every three months. They never once had the contested hearing envisioned under the law. Finally, in September, this is almost a year after the site has been seized, uh, there's been no uh, open hearing, no contested hearing, no evidentiary hearing. The ICE agent admits in his affidavit that they're waiting for the RIAA to answer the questions and to give them probable cause, which they needed to begin with to seize the site. So finally, they just gave the site back after a year. Um, now, I think that's troublesome. Is that happening everywhere? I don't know. I'd sure like to know. Um, I asked the Attorney General in December. We called the staff in advance of the hearing to say, this is what I'm going to ask, so he could be prepared to answer that. And he still didn't know. I think you, know, you need to have a, a framework that involves due process, respect for, um, for the First Amendment uh, as you proceed on this. And we're lacking that because it's overreach. Um, just recently, I saw that the uh, Registrar of Copyright was asserting the right to decide whether or not the makers of phone companies could lock their phones or not and whether it would be possible to, to uh, jailbreak, so-called jailbreak your phone. Well, how did it come that the Registrar of Copyrights is considering that she has the mandate to tell the manufacturers of cell phones in the, in the world how they can design their phone? That's, I mean, the, this is over the top. Now, I, I'll say that I lose these fights and have lost them for the last 18 years. Um, I believe that with new engagement by the American public and maybe the tech sector, we can have a more rational scheme that is respectful of the Constitution and other parties in the arena. Yes, sir. Um, turning to patents, do you think there's any chance of getting uh, any sort of additional patent reform passed? And if so, if so is there anything that can be done for software patents in particular? which have this uh, 30,000 patent problem. Yeah. 
I don't know, as we were having this hearing, Jim Sensenbrenner, and does anybody know who Jim Sensenbrenner is? I, I don't know. But Jim and I don't agree on so many things, but I get along with him fine. I mean, Jim is a smart guy. He's a curmudgeon. I don't think he'd object to my saying that. I think he, you know, it's his persona. And, uh, but in the middle of this hearing, he starts talking about the secret bill. And I'm going, what, what's he talking? I went to my counsel. I said, what's he talking about? Um, apparently, I found out afterwards there is a secret bill um, that's been drafted. It's supposedly technical changes, but it isn't technical changes. And uh, the lobbyists had it. I didn't. Uh, it was apparently the chairman, uh, Chairman Smith, and, and maybe Goodlad. I don't. I think also his staff. I don't know if the in members themselves were involved, and that they thought they would just sort of sneak substantive changes through as a so-called technical amendment. I don't think that's going to work in this environment. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I do think that the issue that I raised so strenuously and actually won the vote on during the patent markup still needs to be addressed, which is small inventors who uh, have to have some, um, some grace period in the filing when you go to first to file, as we, you have, need a robust uh, grace period and they don't have it and the uh, many of the VCs who fund the, these <coughs> small inventors are really up in arms on that. I, I'm hopeful that maybe the secret bill addresses that. We'll see, but I don't think it does. Uh, on software patents, here's what I'm trying to do and I'm not sure we'll succeed. The actors would have to come up with a resolution. And that would be not just the, you know, Oracle and Google, but also small guys. Um, you know, because what we're doing now, if you go to 30 feet, it doesn't help anybody. But you can't ask people who are in the middle of a lawsuit to concede that, it, you know, their position is wrong. I mean, and so the question is, can you get the, an inclusive group of the actors to go to 30,000 feet and say, prospectively, how do we want to do this? And I don't know the answer to that, but I'm trying to work on that. Yes, ma'am. I'd love to hear your perspective on what the drivers are for lawmakers on for and against passing privacy legislation, and based on that, what you think we might see and when actually get passed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's interesting because the um, I've learned you can never take the legislative proposal at face value. Um, I, st I have a son and daughter, they're adults now, but I have a strong belief that you need to have special protections for children uh, who's, who have no capacity really to have a sensible decision on what privacy they're going to allow to be violated because that's why they're children. Um, and, and yet, I can see that being that <laughs> legitimate belief, which I agree with, being utilized actually as a wedge to give the FBI and NSA access to all information. As a matter of fact, there was a proposal to do that sort of with that do-gooder headline. So I, you know, as we're looking into privacy for individuals, we need to keep a big view on who's enforcing, who has access to what without any liability, um, because there are many agendas here. And I don't say that in a negative way about the FBI and NSA either, because I think everything they do, even when I think it's a problem from the Constitution, they're doing it to keep America safe. It's not like they're bad people. They're, they're patriots. They want to keep us safe. They want to keep us from criminals. It's just our job is to make sure the Constitution weighs in on that. Um, you know, the mega, the big companies have interests, and they are divergent. Uh, and they now, the the tech world now has lobbyists, um, and so you know they very properly are using the part of the First Amendment that allows to them to petition their government and lay out their case. So it's very tough to get to move forward. And the I think that the country itself is not of one mind on it. And I think part of it is generational. Um, people who are 20 have a different view of privacy in a Facebook world than, than people who are 70. Uh, and how you craft legislation that reflects those divergent values is a different thing. I probably think 
that the best thing we could do would be to encourage the private sector to uh, be more transparent and to have enforceable rules if people rely on their representations. And that, that would, you know, we always make a mistake. We try and micromanage on the technology because by the time we're through, the technology has changed. Uh, if you have rules that will work in the, in the virtual world as well as not the real world, that are principles that we can demand, they tend to work a lot better. And I think letting people decide for themselves is probably the best way. Yeah. Um, so uh, one quick comment and then a question. On the, um, uh, I think a lot of people who've been following this stuff really appreciate um, you uh, going after a holder for the DJS1 case. Um, there are at least two other sites that, are, that have also tried to get back in domains and haven't yet. Um, so I think that I'd like to know about those. Okay, I can talk to you afterwards. Uh, ZJ okay. is a lawyer here on okay. my staff, uh, does my IP and tech stuff, so right. please I'll give the details to ZJ. There's at least two more, so okay. that, that's interesting. Um, but the, the, um, uh, the second thing is um, you talked about getting, like, uh, the importance of sort of having tech companies and content companies get together and talk about things. Um, you know, we saw last year that more in the, the ISP sp space right. uh, and the content companies get together and sort of come up with a deal that Three a lot strikes. of people are actually <laughs> kind of worried yeah. about. Yeah. And so I wonder, you know, I, I think there's some fear. I mean, you talked about certainly that the, the fight against SOPO was a lot about the, the people rising up, yeah. and not so much the tech companies and not so much Google. So I think there's some fear at least that, you know, getting together again leads to that you know, a situation that, that actually no, I understand. for the people. So how do, we, how do we avoid that? That's why I think the transparency matters. Um, and the day where you can just go and like cut the deal and there it is, I think should be over. Because, you know, I represent a district where most of the people who work in my district have, they're at work because of the tech economy, whether they work directly for a tech company or not. So I'm not hostile to the tech sector that's economic. In fact, I admire those companies and what they've done. Having said that, you know, their interests are, are to innovate, to their shareholders. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not an identical interest to the public interest. And so I think if, if there are discussions uh, and, and suggestions the Congress is going to be part of it, and should be, because we're elected by people. But I think the transparency needs to be there as well, so people can say, yeah, that's OK, or it's not OK, or if we did these three things, that might work. And I think if you have a transparent process that, and the Congress actually responds to the American people, which, as they did in SOPA, that you can end up with a useful result. At least, maybe that's Pollyanna, but <laughs> why not? I couldn't be an optimist. Uh, is there a way no. to, to push that? I mean, I'll tell you right now, I think it, members of the legislature, I can't explain to you what it was like to go on the floor when the blackout was beginning. I mean, the phones were unbelievable. And I had, um, I mean, people look shell shocked. And um, I think people don't want, they don't want that to happen to them again. Um, now, I think there's un been some unfortunate overreach where, you know, somebody in the tech side said, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. That's very unproductive um, because, you know, don't threaten to do something you can't do and when you, it's not up to you anyhow. Um, but I think that, the, you know, having the roof fall in was not a pleasant experience that people want to replicate. And one of the um, members told me that he went to a high school near Hollywood and probably, in his telling, 30, 80% of the kids' parents probably worked for studios, and, and, the, and they all had no on SOPA t-shirts, you know what it is? Like, you know, it, it became a, like a dirty word. It was the number one news story for people under 30 for the two weeks before the blackout, and, and people over 40 didn't even know it was existing. So um, I think that's why, Private collaborative discussions are not wrong so long as they become transparent and it's not the fixes in. Because you, you can't have every private discussion on TV. I mean, I'm, I don't even think that's productive. Um, but there has to be a buy-in, I think, by the public. And I also want to say the role of nonprofits because um, 
EFF and, uh, uh, and others. Um, that's all they do is live to be the proponents of free speech and the like. And I think involving them at an early stage actually will help when you get to the transparency stage where people, it's been vetted. One more? Yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. Sherman, how has the Internet Caucus and the committee incorporated the issue of the unconnected um, throughout the country right. and, and even in California? Mm -hmm. Millions of right. people right. that are not connected, low income, right. uh, non English speaking, um, immigrant communities, seniors, um, disabled, uh, some of us who are working on broadband adoption mm -hmm. um, want to continue doing that work. Um, the uh, uh, stimulus funds um, help some of that. It seems like your the caucus and your committee has to incorporate mm -hmm. that uh, into uh, how do we get people connected? Mm -hmm. I mean, so right. can you can you speak? Well, first let me talk about the Internet Caucus. I mean, it's basically doesn't exist. Uh, we have hundreds of caucuses in the Congress. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, the public, there's no way for the public to know that it's just, it does, we never had a meeting. I mean, it, there is no agenda. It's just well, full that's of, a, well, that's way to know. So that our expectations right. are right. on par with what they can deliver. However, I mean, there, you've identified a very important issue, which is we need to, to deploy broadband massively and affordably. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can't force people to be online if they don't want to. Um, but you, it needs to be possible for people to make the choice. That's right. And one of the, the person who I think is heroic on this is uh, mm -hmm. my colleague, uh, Anna Ashu, mm -hmm. who is the uh, ranking member of the um, telecom uh, subcommittee and the energy and commerce committee, who just pushed like crazy on spectrum is what we need. We need spectrum so that we can deploy further. Um, the thing I did, it's maybe not a little thing, but it's something, it, it matters, is that we have disproportionate taxation of mobile devices, uh, which if you look at who gets online using only a mobile device, it is disproportionately uh, Latinos and low-income individuals and young people that use mobile devices. And we had, I mean, <laughs> In some places, you had taxes on, on access that were like sin taxes, that were higher than tobacco and alcohol taxes. And so we passed a bill. It, was, it took a while because Democrats didn't want to be against taxes and Republicans. But finally, they said, no, this is about access from low-income communities to the Internet. And we had an overwhelming bipartisan vote in the House to freeze those taxes. It's now pending in the Senate, so you can advocate mm -hmm. for that in, in the Senate. It's a, small piece. Uh, some of it is uh, not going to happen with the government. For example, one of the things, and I, they're doing it for commercial advantage, I understand that, but I want to give them credit for it, Comcast mm -hmm. yeah. now has like a $10 deal so that if you want to get internet access and your kid is eligible for the free lunch program, you can have a $10 broadband internet access in your home. That is really a good deal. I mean, that, and that, I give them credit for that. Now, obviously, they're doing it to be given credit for, but they, they got it. So um, part of it is making sure the broadband is out there and also that there's enough competition uh, that, uh, you know, there's a fight for, for sure. owners. No, the accessibility and the, and the cost are, are Absolutely. Really cool. So I think that's maybe one thing that could be done in terms of getting more of the high-tech companies, right. the telecommunications companies to provide right. some of those low cost right. opportunities. One of the, the other thing I'll say, one of the things I did, and this will be a quick story and we'll end, but I was a freshman member of the Congress and we were redoing the tele, Telecommunications Act. And I thought, this is the one time when we can extend universal service. We have a universal service fund so that anybody can get a, like a basic telephone service. We can extend that concept to the end of it. Yes. So I had, I, you know, freshman member, I was on the Judiciary Committee, I had my amendment to do that. And unbeknownst to me, Anna Eshoo had her amendment to do that in Energy and Commerce. And we started the hearing, and Henry Hyde was chairman of the committee, and he said, our adversaries, he said, are the Democrats. Our enemies are the Energy and Commerce Committee. 
we will have no amendments. <laughs> and so I was not permitted to offer my amendment and Anna was not permitted to offer her an amendment. And so we're going through and I put an amendment together, bipartisan, to put on the floor and I waited up till two in the morning in the rules committee and then they wouldn't allow my amendment to be heard on the floor. And I was so outraged that I went up to Newt Gingrich who was then the speaker, and I threw a hissy fit. I'm ranting and raving, and, and for about five minutes, and he looked at me and he said, who are you? <laughs> and he said, we'll do this, give me five minutes. And an hour later, he came and, I, and we actually got uh, an agreement to put universal uh, service, the E-rate, into effect. And the E-rate wasn't everything, but it got internet access into every low-income school in the United States and every library and rural health center. And so that was a big advance. I don't want to say it was enough, but it was a big advance and we have to keep on because if we want a society that closes that gap, we've got to make sure. It's like, you know, my dad was a truck driver. My mother worked in a school cafeteria. They got, they got me a, uh, an encyclopedia. They, they couldn't afford it. But that's what they wanted for their kid, the chance, the opportunity. It's the same thing for kids today. And so we need to make sure that chance is there so that every kid who wants to be a rocket scientist can be. Thanks very much. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Thanks. Congressman thank you. Woman. And um, there are some other events for our State of the Net West on the back. We're going to have your colleague, uh, Congresswoman Eshu, here on September 27th. Ju uh, Commissioner Julie Brill, who is uh, with, with the FTC. And also, we're going to have a really interesting uh, fall conference talking about the software patent problem. So we hope you oh, all good. can come here. Good. Thank you.